to welcome you guys to podcasters learning from other podcasters and so it's that's um at least on the top of my zoom screen it's risa and chris and myself and we're all going to introduce ourselves short uh, briefly but i thought if there were few enough people we could just do a quick whip round of hellos and maybe you know what brought us here today or something like that so i can start off and then popcorn it um i'm john plots and i do a, a podcast with uh I, I love collaborating with my colleague elizabeth uh to do the podcast so that's why i'm excited to be at this panel today and i don't know chris can i toss it to you to introduce yourself Sure. I'm a professor at New Jersey Institute of Technology, and uh, my experience with podcasting, I, I address in the little talk that I'm giving, um, but I come to it via radio, and um, I teach podcasting in the last uh, few years, which is something I've become very passionate about. And Chris, do you just want to pass it on to someone? Risa, go ahead. Okay. Hi, I'm Risa um, Gorlick. I am at NJIT as well. Uh, my office is next to Chris's. I'm a university lecturer. Um, for the last 28 years, I have been the co-chair of the Research Network Forum at the Conference on College Composition and Communications at Four Cs. Um, so a lot of people know me from that. Uh, and I am not a podcaster yet, um, but I teach senior seminars and um, communications classes at NJIT in addition to writing courses. And I've allowed seniors and uh, in my seminar to podcast in place of papers when I realized that they are graduating seniors and are haven't written anything since their first semester or second semester of college and they're rusty and I want good projects that I, you know, so that's my take on this. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Thanks. Uh, Elizabeth, <laughs> I'll pass it on to you. Hi, I'm uh, Elizabeth. Um, I'm a professor along with John at, at um, Brandeis University. And uh, whereas he's in uh, literature, I'm in anthropology and uh, really enjoyed doing the podcast. Did not um, know what I was doing at all when I started four years ago, maybe. Um, and somewhat know what I'm doing more, but three years ago. Uh, but, uh, you know, looking forward to um, hearing from people about about what works for them. Um, I'm excited even about the knitting podcasting nexus. So maybe that's our next podcast. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Daniel. Hi everyone. Um, I'm Dan. Um, I'm uh, podcasting. I've been podcasting for about two years or so. Um, I have two podcasts: a writing remix uh, and um, and a kind of comedy and pop culture podcast called The Nostalgia Test that I do with my friend, who's a microbrewer. And we actually started doing uh, episodes with um scholars of pop culture and nostalgia and stuff from all over the world recently and those actually have been catching on and it's been fun to kind of do these type of weird academic podcasts with a co-host who's not in academia and who's like super energetic and curious about it so i think like there's i'm learning a lot about how especially in the academic space the the crossover to a podcast space that isn't as like that there's no academic pressure, but the conversation goes so deep no matter what. And it's been it's been fun to see people kind of get really excited about that. So, but I'm looking forward to learning more about being a better podcaster, really. That's kind of the idea. Thank you. And um, pass it to Avon. Hi, um, yeah, I'm Avon McMaster. I'm a, an ex-academic up in, uh northern ontario in canada and a uh, classicist by training and i have a podcast called the endless knot with my husband about um etymology and history and cocktails and really anything we feel like talking about the theme is connections unexpected connections which gives us license to do anything we darn well please um we don't talk about knitting very much but you never know it could get there uh, i'm re-entering my knitting phase uh now that i'm not presenting today, I realized that I could do something else to keep my hands occupied, which didn't involve looking at Twitter. 
which is what my fingers do if I let them go without noticing <laughs> what I'm doing. I end up on Twitter and I'm like, wait, how did that happen? Um, so I, I've been podcasting since 2015. I really enjoy it, but I know there's always more to learn. And I also am very invested in the idea of community among independent po podcasters, people who don't have networks or institutes or whatever else to be uh, a support group for them. So that concept is something I'm always interested in and, and interested in learning more about. And why don't I, since those who joined later, I think we're doing a little whip round of introducing people. So Lacey, do you want to go next? Maybe I can invite, so I see three folks who have their uh, screens muted. Lacey, uh, uh, pardon me if I mispronounce, Shrikant and Leah, and basically invite any of you guys if you want to, to introduce yourselves. But if not, we can just kind of keep moving or you can introduce yourselves in chat too. Um, I'll quickly start if that is fine. My name is Shrikant and I'm, I'm from Pune, India. And um, I'm uh, I'm an independent audio creator. I used to work in Indian radio and now I'm trying to transition into a more serious form of audio uh, production and audio storytelling. And uh, I, 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 I'm attending this because the last time I attended uh, the HPN Symposium, I came away with a lot of knowledge. So I'm hoping to gather some more knowledge uh, this year as well. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Hi. Well, my name is Lacey Rubio. I'm from Cuba and I'm doing my PhD in Dublin City University. I'm researching podcasting in Cuba. I just have entered my second year and I'm trying to understand. Apologies for the, for the noise. <laughs> um, so um, Saturday shores at home. So um, I'm trying to understand how podcasting can create, articulate, and maintain communities through storytelling and co-creation practices. So that would be my my research topic. And I'm glad to be here. I think it's a valuable encounter and I really appreciate all the conferences and workshops that are happening here. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. That's really exciting to hear from all of you, especially I love the idea of a dissertation that has podcasts in it. That's so great. Um, so, so we, our plan was, we basically been asked to divide the hour between half the three of us kind of structuring a conversation and leading off by presenting some stuff and then hopefully flowing out into the second half of the hour, which would then be, you know, a conversation and then, uh, you know, maybe Chris at the end will kind of wrap up and think about if there's takeaways or next steps for us all here together. And the order that we sort of, I think it was alphabetical we decided on. So Chris is going to. Uh, kick us off. Yeah, I presume you can hear me. All right. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, so preparing to speak at the session today, my discussion became pointed more towards teaching podcasting, which is something I'm heavily involved in, rather than anything else, uh, which I was hoping would be all right. Uh, but I was then reminded that the audience may have come to hear about the stated topic, uh, so I'll try to do that and perhaps we can talk about teaching as the session goes on. Um, since there are many types of podcasts, I do think it's difficult to generalize in saying something about how someone should approach doing a podcast and uh, speaking most generally, and this is something I tell my students, I would say to avoid using a cookie cutter template or the same formula every time you do an episode. I don't mean to be critical of those or many people who use this approach and sometimes such familiarity I find welcoming. I'm just saying it's okay to give yourself permission to use various approaches. I've worked as a radio programmer intermittently for nearly 40 years and seven years ago became an accidental podcaster since by default, my monthly radio program, Poet Radio, uh, becomes a podcast upon broadcast thanks to the techno wizards at WGXC Wave Farm in Hudson, New York. Uh, due to the nature of my podcast, which sometimes features live guests and is other times based on archival recordings I've made, I've had to embrace 
different approaches for many reasons, sometimes due to time constraints and also because not doing it the same way helps keep things interesting. The majority of the 80 plus episodes I produced have featured live guests. And above all, I see these episodes as being true collaborations. My tendency is not to script such episodes formally, but to inform guests of an overall structure and then let them know largely out of courtesy if there are specific things I plan to ask them about. Since it's a literary podcast, I like to feature the guest writing more than anything else and spontaneously build dialogue around what they read. While I sometimes receive manuscripts or materials in advance of a program and sometimes do prepare by reading, using this process nonetheless requires that I have to listen carefully to the, what they're reading, which I guess would be an obvious necessity and is something I take a great pleasure in, especially since the stated premise of the show is that I will quote, blend words and sounds, bringing to the airwaves live performances as well as field and studio recordings by writers I've crossed paths with over the past quarter century. Both my background experience as an improvisational musician and the fact that my guests are typically people I know and certain and like certainly helps me be comfortable in that moment, uh, which I think can be awkward. Uh, even the process of making recordings at events or in context outside of the radio podcast production involves communication and collaboration with artists, whether it's as simple as asking for permission to do so or making more elaborate plans um, due to working in radio, I granted myself the authority to teach podcasting courses beginning in 2019 and I'm currently teaching a course titled Podcast Practicum for the fifth time at New Jersey Institute of Technology. Students in the course create a series of elementary podcasts based on their own personal interest. I make clear podcasting is not only mechanical and technical, it's creative, performative, and also demanding in terms of time and the type of attention required in almost every aspect of the pursuit. The mechanical editing we do often requires a type of surgical precision. And as I mentioned before, when podcasts involve dialoguing with another person, everyone needs to pay close attention, and listen carefully to what's being said. I'll uh, sort of wrap things up here by saying there's more to cultivating a podcast than knowing how to use equipment and software programs, which is by now knowledge it can be somewhat acquired via online tutorials. Though possessing those skills are obviously important. As a teacher, I always find it crucial to have an authoritative textbook for students to refer to, something that provides context for the endeavor beyond technique which can be useful to students when a professor is unavailable. I did not learn about podcasting from a book, but for my students, I did some research on the subject. At present, I assign Everybody Has a Podcast Except You by Justin Travis and Griffin McElroy due to its utility, readability, and affordability. So you want to start a podcast, finding your voice, telling your story, and building a community that will listen by Kristen Meinzer was also on a short list. The McElroy book is dialogically composed by professionals who at every turn make attempts not only to be clear about what podcasting involves, but also interject levity and humor into their helpful discussions, recording, pre-production, tools, recording, editing, as well as promotion. I invite you to take a listen to the archives of my podcast radio program, as well as explore the syllabus of my course at NJIT, which I'll paste and I'll paste those links into the chat now and happy to discuss any aspect of podcasting with you once we open up the discussion. Cool. Thank you so much, Chris. That's really great, a great uh, start. And I'm going to um, share my screen. Uh, so let me know if you can see it. Um, is that visible? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks. So this is just, I, these are quick slides. I could have them off maybe just in a couple minutes. I just wanted to sort of frame this out. So Elizabeth is here and I hope she will jump in as well. But just to say, you know, really echo Chris's point. I, I hadn't really thought about it, Chris, but I think you put it well, like every podcast, every podcast that is interview or conversation based has other podcasters in it because your guests are 
part of the podcasting experience as well. Like the conversation itself is a part of the exploration and experiment. It's not all the technological side. It's also the building the conversation that will work. And I do enjoy the difference of those different conversations that we have. So um, in that in this context, um, maybe the distinctive feature of our podcast um, is that it's always a triangular conversation. Elizabeth and I come, as she said, from different disciplines. So we already think of ourselves as being somewhat separated from one another. And then we have a third person who comes, you know, maybe from the world of academia, often either a writer or an academic, but, you know, comes and then becomes like the third uh, side of that triangle. Um, and, you know, we've tried to keep it in terms of varying our approach, which I again, I agree with your point, Chris, we've tried to have sort of different mini series. So we had a series about the notion of the Brahmin left, um, meaning, you know, how how the left wing at, and higher education have clustered together, kind of an eight, unexpected sociological development. And, you know, for that, I did it, I co hosted it with a different sociologist, like Elizabeth kind of rotated away, and we had a sociologist from a nearby university come in um but you know other we've had other um uh series that did different things um we have also tried to bring in undergraduates um especially this was elizabeth's idea totally wonderful idea where every year there's something called the new student book forum where all the freshmen first years read a book together and we had a couple of the first years help us do the podcast where we had a conversation with the author of that book so just, you know, we're always trying to think of ways where we get a, a different set of voices in. Um, it sounds like, Chris, we're kind of on the same wavelength. We've, I mean, timeline, we've got about 90 episodes so far. Um, we partnered with a, a publication called um, Public Books, which I, we could talk about. And then also we are now distributed through something through the new, called the New Books Network. But in terms of our relationship with other podcasts, the first thing we did was find a colleague of ours um, named Jared Green, who's one of the hosts of this show called the Electro Library. And uh, basically, they have a very highly, they have kind of an audio environment podcast. They don't put out that many episodes. They're beautifully put together. They're very well edited. We are not capable of editing like that, but we brought him in to talk with us and um, and then also play parts of his podcast. And it was a good challenge to us to think about how to make our kind of, I wouldn't say we're lo-fi, but maybe we're medium-fi. And how did our medium-fi audio fit with his hi-fi, with his team's hi-fi? And that was a, a good conversation. It didn't lead to further collaboration, but he's still a friend and we have theoretically have a happy hour that we have for the podcast in Boston. Um, which hasn't really met since the pandemic or during the pandemic, but in, in practice, you know, in theory, he's part of our happy hour community. And then um, our second collaboration was with a, a different podcast that I co-hosted um, with a different colleague at Duke, Arthi Vade, and that's called Novel Dialogue. And basically, that in that case, we don't actually spend that much time together. It's more that we cross post their episodes so we find episodes by them that we admire and we put them into kind of a we, we have sort of a rebroadcast slot the second slot of every month is a is our rebroadcast space and so we we put the episodes into that space i mean i still feel connected to them because i'm part of that podcast but it is a less direct connection and then finally and this is it this is my last example the third um group is uh, people you may have met already at the conference, which is uh, Kim Adams and Saronic Bosu, who are leading members of the Humanities Podcast Network. They have a wonderful and I think incredibly successful um, podcast called High Theory. The episodes are very short. They're very different from ours. And again, we couldn't figure out a way to do an episode together, but instead, I what we basically did, we fabricated an episode that had the structure of their podcast but put into our longer 40 minute uh, conversation. And we talked about the pastoral, which is something that Saronic is working on in his own scholarly work. And we tried to use both the format of high theory and the format of our, um, of recall this book. And I loved that experiment. And then we have also posted one of their later episodes, an episode um, called about uh, teletherapy, 
uh, with Hannah Zeven that was incredibly wonderful. And it, the book has done incredibly well. As, and we just loved the episode. And so we put it up and rebroadcast it as a Recall This Book episode. So those are those are my examples. I'm going to stop the share now. Um, and yeah, um, I mean, I don't have a single takeaway from those three, but just, you know, be happy to explore more. I, I think basically I, I get so many good ideas about where episodes can go. I mean, Elizabeth and I get ideas virtually only by talking to one another. And then when we are in contact with other podcasters, we just find, you know, the challenge of understanding why they made the decisions they did as opposed to our decisions has been incredibly productive for us. So anyway, thanks. Over to you, Risa. Thanks. Um, can I share a screen? Am I allowed to do that? All right, let me see if I can get this to work. Can you see my screen? Okay. Um, we will start. All right. You can see that. Okay. Um, so here's my contact information. Um, I am talking about, you know, food equity and justice. I teach a senior seminar on food narratives. And the first time I taught it was in uh, 2020, uh, the fall, uh, all synchronously online because of COVID. I taught from home that year. Um, and so I, it was supposed to be a writing intensive course. It was listed under an English um, seminar title. And from there, um, when I got the first set of papers in, uh, this tells you a little bit about the senior seminar. Um, is this box so I can see what it says. Uh, the senior seminar is basically a, cult, a cultivating um, experience uh, that is a requirement for all students at NJIT, which is primarily a STEM uh, institution. We're now trying to get um, a Hispanic, uh, primarily Hispanic serving institution as well uh, that they're working on now. But um, so the students are very diverse uh, from all over uh, the country, but primarily from New Jersey and um, or abroad. And what I learned was most of them hadn't had a writing class since their first year. And if they had AP credit, um, they haven't had one while they were in college. So um, there is supposed to be a research component to it. And um, so here's a, a blurb from my course from a couple of semesters ago. I've tweaked it a little, um, but this is what I've talked about in the slides, um, that food is a human basic need. And we were looking at um, how during COVID food has changed in terms of supply chain, in terms of you know not being able to necessarily go to the restaurants that we once went to without thinking about it, um, but also looking at um, globalization, localization, social movements that affect food and culture. And um, I was interested in the stories that were surrounding them. It was primarily a narratives course. Um, and what I ended up doing after getting the first assignment um, was saying, okay, rather than, I divided it into three projects. Um, and the first one was a food war, uh, which is a memory about food. And here's a definition of a food war. Um, there's a big blend, uh, a big market for this. I figured if they liked to write and had a story to tell, and most of the students who signed up for this said they were foodies, um, although that was not a prerequisite. Uh, that there was there was an audience for this if they wanted to do that and and that I liked those kinds of stories and um, but when they wrote the first one I had a bunch of students who who were not strong writers and I've taught writing since 1992 um, I'm good at it but I can't teach the contents the uh, contents of the course and writing at the same time at that level so I decided I wanted to focus on the course and gave them other options. So we talked with students and said, you know, you know, what about if we do a podcast or a video? Um, but you have to know how to do these skills because I don't know how to teach them to you yet. So that was the caveat that, you know, that they, and they're pretty techno savvy so they could figure out how to record. And, um, and some of them already had podcasts, which was kind of cool. Um, some of them have taken Chris's class. I have a couple of his students this semester um, in my senior seminar. So um, I'm looking forward to what they're gonna do. So the foodware um, tells 
the, the assignment was, you know, um, a short piece uh, where they talk about a memory associated with food. The food does not have to be center, um, but can be. And uh, Julene talks about how um, she was adopted um, while she was in the Philippines uh, at a, by a young age from an, and a, there was a kind elderly, elderly woman who fostered her. Um, the daughter ended up adopting her. Uh, but when she was having a really low day, the uh, person who became her grandmother said, do you wanna learn her secret noodles, um, her pansy? And, um, and then told her that in order um, for them to do that, she has to make her family because it's a family secret. So that was a really, um, really powerful uh, presentation. Um, I had another student named Janelle um, who's, I loved the, the quote that she gave from her mom that said, I couldn't ever tell you how to do this from a memory. I've never written it down because this was a project. The second project is a recipe and an interview. So they could write it up as a blog. They can write it up as an article. They could do it as a, as a cooking show. If they're on video, they could do it as a podcast. So she did her mom and the Jamaican Coke curry that um, she found comfort with and uh, Janelle's mom said that the only way you'll ever pick this up is from the experience of her family, which I think um, this assignment I really like because most students have no idea where the foods that they love come from. And it allows them to uh, experience this kind of uh, family history and folklore and food ways. Um, when I, I did my graduate work in Louisiana a long time ago, but um, I had students research and write in freshman comp on family recipes because we were an open admission university at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette when I started there. And um, most of the students uh, were first-generation college students who grew up in a very agricultural area. So they were on sugarcane farms, they farmed crawfish, they, uh, you know, their families were, you know, had shrimp boats, stuff like that. And I found that if I showed them that their family knows a whole lot of information that's not necessarily from books, um, that all education is valuable, that came across uh, as a real strong positive. And they, so I like these kind of uh, narrative uh, interviews. And I think this really lends well to podcasting. So they're working on this now. This is due in another, I think, week or two, and we'll see what they come up with. Um, I'm happy to share them if they give permission. Um, and for the final project, which is 25% of their grade plus a 15% um, presentation, I've allowed them to do a paper, a podcast, a video. Some of them want to do multimedia. If they have a, another idea, great, propose it to me. Um, my caveat is that they have to have at least seven sources for which must be from databases. I learned last week that a lot of my students this semester had no idea what I meant by a database. So I opened up the what library you know databases and showed them how to search them and um, and that they could do it on any aspect that relates to the course with cultural issues of food health related uh, sustainability food insecurity we talk about a lot food trends um, technologies uh, I had a lot of information um, a lot of projects on uh, fake meat and, and that, uh, you know, and, and why would anybody want to eat this? And, and is it any good for you? And, you know, some of them, you know, that's probably the most engineering applied uh, project that they could do. But I said to them this semester, like, if you know, I have a lot of uh, architecture students at NJIT as well. And I'm like, if you want to design a restaurant or, you know, like a post COVID type of place where people would be more comfortable, like do something that's good for your portfolio. So we'll see what they come up with. Um, to the next slide. Okay, um, so here's some of the projects that students have done. Uh, Arrow Farms of Newark, New Jersey is the largest vertical farm at the time in the country. I don't know if it still is, um, but it's near campus. They won't let anybody in, but they could do some research on, uh, you know, about what the local papers and the New York Times have covered about it. Um, so here's some of the projects that they, they worked on. Um, you know, food fraud, how the nutrition labels aren't really telling you the whole story. Um, and they've been really fun. So that's my talk and thank you for listening. I'm happy to take questions later. I will unshare my screen if I can figure that out. Okay, thank you. Cool.
Okay, and so you guys, it's is a small group, so the the structure of this should be pretty uh, open form. But maybe we could start. Basically, Reese is going to keep an eye on the chat, and I'm going to be the the voice of like just calling on people for comments, and then and then Chris will sort of round things off at the end. But um, you know, maybe we could start out if people have specific questions or comments aimed at what the three presenters had to say, and then we can segue. From <laughs> A more general conversation. So yes, yeah, Shrikant. Yeah, um, my question is actually a bit of a specific thing for uh, Riza. Uh, what were the databases you mentioned on the slide? Could you give us an example of what kind of databases you asked them to look into? Um, we're an engineering school, so a lot of the databases that our university subscribes to are engineering based. So unless they're doing something that's going to focus on an engineering base, the databases that they're using are pretty basic, like ProQuest, um, and uh, you know, the, the, the few humanities-based stuff that we have at NJIT. I tell them their local libraries um, would probably have a better selection if they want to focus specifically on food issues. So okay. uh, fair, fair. Uh, I, I was actually kind of trying to figure out what kind of information they were supposed to take out of their database and use uh, um, articles, their... like either articles or podcasts or like research. It's a research-based writing class. So that my caveat for whatever whatever modality they're using, whether it's a paper, a podcast, a video, is that it has to be research. They can't just tell me, um, as one student did. Uh, which is why I put in all the caveats. Uh, he, he did it on avocados and just talked about how he loved, it was an ode to an avocado, which for a poetry class oh. might have been fun, um, but he didn't have any research based on that. So I wanted to make sure that if they were gonna do it on something like avocados, they needed to look into the sustainability issues of how much water it's taking away from other places that they're being grown. Uh, like, does that make sense? Yes. Can, no, can uh, I just- yeah, I can I just add, sorry, that I think it's a, I think you mean specifically you're talking about bibliographical databases, yeah. right? Not databases of data in the sense that right, I think right. that's the only confusion there that might oh, be. Okay, uh, so you yeah, mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you mean like, uh, like JSTOR or ProQuest right, or yeah. um, places where you can find articles and, and uh, resources like that. Sorry, just to. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. You, you basically connected both thought processes. So thank you so much. Okay. Hey, Risa, I want to ask you a question uh, also, and that is like what it sounds like you're doing, and this is something that a professor from NYU was saying at the uh, plenary yesterday is, you know, after years and years of required requiring writing assignments, you're now allowing students to do podcast uh, podcast instead. And I was wondering, and I, which is, you know, for me as an audio person is, uh, uh, I can't even remember the last time I graded a paper, but um, <laughs> the, the much to the chagrin of the writing program at our own university, but whatever. Um, what is this like for you? And are there any negatives uh, to it? Or is it all um, is it all positive? I mean, some of them are better than others. Some of them are some of them are really savvy where they can put the the you know the soundtracks in them and the and, and things like that. Um, I, I'm looking, I'm still looking for the same things that I would look for in a paper. It's just that I don't, you know, and, and I still want structure and organization and grammar um, as they're speaking, but I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time saying your subjects and verbs don't agree and you're you need a comma here. And, and things like that. So I think that's been a little freeing for me as somebody who's, you know, um, graded so many, like I've, they're, they're, it's a different type of grading for me. Also, as I started to do this, I went paperless and I am somebody who loves paper. And what I realized after reading an article out of, from the Harvard president that talked a couple of weeks ago about how students can't read script. They can't read cursive, they weren't taught it. And I had no idea. And so I had been writing all these long notes on papers for years and years and years, and no one ever asked me anything about them. Um, and when I moved to grading it online, because we had to, uh, students would be like, I don't, how did, how'd you come up with this number? Because instead of giving an A, I have to give a 93. And I'm like, I left you all this comments. And they're like, you did? And I'm like, it's yeah. in track changes. So, you know, I think that I'm still doing that. I'm still giving them feedback, but not, it, 
not on the textual level as more as I'm more interested in the story and what they learned and how they're going to apply this um, knowledge to wherever they're going after NJIT. Uh, sorry, quick follow up to that. Uh, have you uh, felt that the students are now able to understand and explain their chosen topics better because they they practically did it as as a podcast. So uh, instead of uh, losing it out after putting it on paper, they are now able to better understand and explain the topic to someone else. I think for some of them, maybe. Um, again, I haven't done this that long, and not everybody has done a podcast, so I've only I've I've had you know a bunch. I think students think it'll be easier. I don't necessarily know that they find out that it is because they still have to do the research and they still have to organize it in a way so that when they're when they're presenting it, it makes sense and it's it's. You know, on a paper, what, you know, I think I think the idea of writing a paper is that they write a paper for a course, and then you give it back to them, and then they toss it in the trash. Like it, does, like that's the purpose of the paper. I think, mm. I think some of the podcasting and the videos and stuff like that see that like they can share this with other people, especially I, if it's their grandmother yeah. or something that they're interviewing. Can I actually use that build a bridge? I don't know if people want to talk about. Um, when you actually make your own podcast, what the feedback process is, because I reason I really like your point about the the different the difference it makes to be responding to people on audio. And like Elizabeth, you and I have a very weird kind of it's almost like schizophrenic where we talk to each other about the concept in very vague terms. And then we give very specific audio notes, which are just pegged to like, you know, three dash forty five. So I don't know if other people I'd, I'd love to hear other people's thoughts about like what is the feedback mechanism like what do you how do you talk to each other about specifics in a podcast. I don't have an answer to that, but I'd like to build on that question, which is that because um, you know this question of learning from other podcasters in general. Um, there, it, you know, feedback is one of the things I think podcasters are most hungry for, really, like audience feedback, for instance, or, you know, when I talk to other podcasters about their podcasts, one is generally very positive and friendly and, you know, like that there isn't, which is not a bad thing, but um, there's not a sort of obvious space for critique there's, because there's no, and I'm not advocating for necessarily peer review processes for advert, you know, that is a thing some people are thinking about, it's not necessarily one I'm really gung ho on but um but the there's no peer review process there's no like gatekeeper which is great but that also means there's no form for critiques or feedback or um you know help in that way and one tends to be especially with other independent podcasters want to be very supportive which means you know when you speak to another podcaster crit criticizing what they do even if it's in the most supportive way is not necessarily what you do and then your audience members, you get very little feedback. I find that we get, you know, you get some, I love your podcast, or you get, oh my God, you've been too political. That's it. I can't listen to you talking about politics anymore, which is the most negative. That's basically the only negative feedback we get uh, occasionally. And then that's it. So um, it makes what you say about like, how do you give feedback? It makes me think about, is there, is that something that like, critiques, you know, would be an interesting thing. So that's a question, not a comment, sorry. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm totally with you. I think I saw Sh Shrikant first and then Elizabeth. No, uh, please, Elizabeth, go ahead, because I was going to uh, come at this topic from, from a commercial sort of perspective, because that's the kind of podcasting I've been doing. So I'm, I'm, I'm uh, actually quite interested to hear what you have to say. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks. Um... So I was just kind of thinking it, I don't even know if this is a question or a comment, but um, just kind of thinking, coming out of thinking about teaching podcasting and podcasting as a form of writing, uh, and then sort of putting that together with what John, um, John just put his finger on a part of our process, we haven't yet sort of specified exactly that way about the, about two stages, right? So, so there's a kind of you know, the way we approach our podcast is we're, we're sort of staging a conversation. So we give some as maybe kind of as Chris was describing too, like we give some, some guidelines, some sort of, you know, um, create a, try to create a situation in which an exciting conversation will happen, but without 
pre uh, ordaining too closely what that's going to look like. And then we're quite precise in the in the editing process um, about thinking about the shape of this. And in some ways, that's similar. It is a form of writing in the sense that you know writing is a kind of textualization of thinking, and it does require both of those things right it requires kind of conceptualizing what it is you're you want to write but then also approaching that as something now external to you that you shape as a text and so just occurs to me that that's a that's a sort of interesting dimension of of feedback i think dan was next yeah i mean i think the getting feedback part is really a difficult part i mean like this being in a collective like this this has been like the most learning and feedback like it's the most like exchange that i've had because you always feel like you're out there in the ether on your own amongst like millions of podcasts and three quarters of them are abandoned anyway like a lot of the time but like you're kind of trying to build community one of the places what's interesting is like i've had good experiences building communities with both podcasts especially the, the the pop culture podcasts on like instagram and twitter and there are a lot of like um um like the, tw the like when they there's a lot of podcasters holding like twitter um, groupings or whatever i forget what it's called but like you know they're they're having like little forums here and there like all day or you can you know really communicate with people about collaboration and things like that but i think in the terms of feedback it's really difficult especially on my end considering like now i do my main part this podcast by myself so like i don't have a co-host i don't have anybody i have like me looking at it being like okay what did i do what should i do next time and and um so it is a little more difficult. Uh, the other one is like, we can have those discussions and look back on old episodes and we change our formatting and things like that. So it's only been between us uh, with the co-host, but feedback is, I think of this as just as much as like a, like a creative writing group, like, you know, positive reinforcement and workshopping. Like how do we build those kind of writing groups and, and kind of create that? Um, but yeah, feedback is, you know, hopefully like, as communities build that's that can be part of it because we're also like in competition with podcasters that have like extreme teams of people like celebrities are kind of coming into these spaces and they're they're like the that type of thing is there that saturation and algorithms change on social media every day so it, it does make it more difficult so we I need people to kind of know when things are changing to kind of tell everyone chris how do you do it well, in my class, I, I tell you, I, I do require peer review in my classes. My students do listen to each other's podcasts, and I have a form that I've devised that, uh, you know, is based on the rubrics of the class. Um, so, you know, they ask students to analyze the authority, objectivity, accuracy, ability, engagement, and critical thinking of the podcast. Now, with my own podcast, the only person that people I ever get feedback from is the guests on the show. Um, almost never. I mean, I can get stats on how many people listen to the podcast or radio archive, but uh, yeah, that's that's difficult. And I know I've done something special if I do get an email about a show, um, but I certainly don't expect that at all. Um, but that's not why I do it either. So it's you know. Uh, it's kind of a leap of faith that you know you're able to maintain a certain level of integrity and quality and you just hope that somebody hears it and you know i know that people i know that people do but i i do like this uh i really admire john and, and elizabeth this idea that you're out there actively building communities through your podcast and i'm i'd like to be able to do that a little bit more i mean it would help the for the feel less a little less isolated for sure so Thanks for planting that idea into my head. Elizabeth and I have had that same thought about the absence of feedback from audiences. Like we get download numbers from the New Books Network, but they seem to have, they don't have much to do with our own sense of when an episode succeeds. Like Elizabeth does a lot of wonderful poetry episodes and poetry just seems to get fewer listeners. And it doesn't matter because we can have these amazing episodes and then, you know, 
wah, wah. And then other episodes were like, why? Why are people listening to that? And we don't know. So yeah, Dan? Yeah, I just it's funny because I just did like I did all these like very hard hitting episodes about the one about the Second Amendment, one about this. And you're like, oh, this is the one that's going to be, you know, this is good. And then and you say I do a newsletter and stuff like that. And recently I did a solo episode where it was just me for, like talking about my like up and down journey of becoming a professor. And I get an email from a colleague, like the first one ever being like, this one really resonated with me. And I'm like, and I was happy about it. That's great. And it's like, we're at episode 92. And I'm like, okay, like, but it's interesting to see kind of which ones do resonate with the audience and who feels uh, compelled to reach out. Even when you're asking even for ideas, being like, hey, I'm doing this open questionnaire, like episodes, send your questions, and we'll like, you know, get to know the host or whatever. And depending on the social media that you use too, you'll get answers. Instagram, you don't get as much response. On Twitter, I'll get like a list a lot of times. Like people are like, boom, 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 they'll respond. But like, it's interesting where those things come from and who's engaging and whether it's feedback or participation and things. It's a, it's really, you got to know which, which space is going to, you're going to get the, this type of, of, of engagement and feedback, even LinkedIn, like it's very hard to get things from, and you would think in the professional space, the social media space should be like, oh, here's an academic podcast. I'm looking for people to kind of collaborate here. The most I get is from calling a CFP, for putting a CFP out and I get guest proposals constantly, so. Srikant, did you still have your hand up there or is that? He, he put it in um, the chat. Oh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I, I've, I've put a question in the chat and uh, it's something I'd be curious to know from you, but uh, something Chris said um, kind of, uh, uh, hit me uh he, you guys said you invite your students to listen to each other's podcasts and give them uh, uh give each other feedback but uh, that i'm i'm not sure if that works if the podcast made by the student is not intended for that specific audience so uh i'm, I'm pretty sure you guys have a mechanism for that uh the other thing i want to talk about was uh a lot of podcasting uh, happens on platforms that are not designed to receive audience feedback to receive uh, information from the other side of the equation so uh, yeah. what happens yeah. is most podcasters end up assuming that episodes that get downloaded or episodes that see engagement or uh, uh, bits of episodes that see engagement on social media are the ones that are good and then try and design I'm, I'm speaking purely from the commercial perspective because that is the kind of podcasting i'm into i'm i'm more into figuring out uh, how to pitch podcasts to uh, clients to corporates to uh, various other people who would want their own podcast and sort of uh, create their own brands etc so um, i have noticed that in terms of building a community a platform that allows for audience engagement is much better than the typical podcasting platforms like Libsyn, like uh, Anchor, like uh, Podbean or uh, Fireside or any of those, because YouTube allows for people to comment at whatever point they want. SoundCloud used to be a good one, but then SoundCloud stopped being a good uh, podcasting um, uh, platform. So um, that that is something that I would probably uh, recommend in case you are interested in getting feedback from your audience figure out whether or not your platform allows for it the other way to do it is to use something like voice form or rumble studio where you can ask people to give their comments in audio which then you can probably use in your podcast and again i'm coming from this from a very commercial perspective uh, i'm not an academician but i love uh, uh, learning about the uh, the science of the whole thing which is why i'm here so again sorry if i yeah, yeah don't be sorry it's all good i think it's a good idea to ask for feedback whether or not you'll get it yeah that, that's tough harder I to think, i think leslie has her hand up like my real hand yeah. <laughs> i couldn't find the, the visual <laughs> hand no, I just wanted to share with you that at least in Cuba, because of all the technological challenges that people might change might face while trying to access to podcasts, because um, a lot of podcasters don't use the traditional or conventional podcasting platforms, 
uh, some of the most popular are hosted on social media like Telegram, for example. And they are using the social media platform potential to create an experience that although have the podcast as the center of the content, it invites people to participate through other kind of exercises, let's say poll, questions, even content, uh, yeah. contests that can be hosted in this kind of, of platforms. And another thing that happened during the pandemic, especially during the, Latin, the lockdown periods, was that some podcasts invited their listeners to contribute by reading, uh, for example, their favorite um, stories or their favorite poetry, and then they combine those audios in a series um, within their own podcast. And there are ways to bridge that gap between the podcast and the community. And it, it requires creativity and it requires also to move a bit, for, um, push, push a bit forward that frontier that sometimes podcasters just lock themselves in audio storytelling uh, when you really can recreate a more transmedia storytelling. You can bridge that gap, you can invite your listeners to meet for coffee someday and maybe just one person will show up but it is it's also about making it more human and and also giving space to those who are listening to you um and not only um, let's say an email saying oh i love your episode but what about if that person has something to contribute uh, what about if they hear themselves in the podcast it's it's gonna be him and then he's gonna want his family to listen to the podcast because it's like yes i'm there <laughs> um and it's, it's also creating that, that collaboration and a bit of co-creation in the sense of really giving space for people to shape your own space. So that will be my comment. Thank you. Dan, I think you get the last word before Chris goes to summing up, so. Oh, I think you're muted. I love this conversation because like there's a people it's like academics in a room or people just also wanting feedback because anytime like we just write articles or working on articles I'm not looking to be like man I hope people reach out to me about my article that I read wrote right it's almost like I wrote the article it's good here's a point on my CV where like this is much this is like you know, and I'm going to be doing this uh, podcasting and scholarly recognition. And the idea like is like, well, what does that mean? Right. And I'm loving this idea that like feedback is so important. Engagement is so important. So I'm just like, it, it energizes me to think like in these spaces, like we want that. Where like with an article, it's like, I never, th who's thinking about that from, you know, like it's, it goes out and it's like, yay. And I'm done. Like, you know, on to the next one. But thank you so much. This has been great. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. It's been the yesterday's session that I was at and, and this session both very uh, illuminating. And, um, you know, I, I guess I, I, yeah, John has asked me to, to sum up. I don't, I, I mean, I don't have anything to say beyond what I would have said after the first few minutes of this uh, group dialogue. And, and that is that podcasting, it, it's very clear that podcasting is a practice of talking and listening uh, both e equally probably and um, you know we build content we build uh, knowledge through speaking and dialogues and and also listening to what other people have to say and I, I want to just put in a plug for for uh, listening especially and I wish I could teach a course on listening but in lieu of that, I've, and I'm sure that people have done it, although I've never seen evidence of it. Um, in lieu of that, what I have done, and I do think this is, a, 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 this is pretty progressive, is that I do spend an hour, about half of a class, an hour and a half, up to an hour and a half each evening of doing listening sessions where my students have to bring in a podcast episode for everybody to listen to. I ask them to put their phones away. They're just listening to this. They're listening to the content. They're listening to production value. And I, I think that we can all benefit from just practicing listening. Of course, we all need to be articulate and be able to shape our ideas and, and form speech and, and what have you. But the, uh, you know, the value of listening is definitely under uh, acknowledged. 
Uh, so, John, I don't. That's all. That's really in terms of wrapping things up. What I have to say has been a, a, been great to hear everybody speaking, and I've taken something away from each and every one of you today. Yeah, me too. And does any? I mean, if anyone else wants to jump in, we have literally like ninety seconds left. But if there's other takeaways that people want to kind of bounce back into the group. Can I just um, say that I've just put in, I'm about to put in the chat, the participation form. Oh, thank that, you so much. Um, yes. This is, if you don't already, if you aren't already on the HPN email list, please put your name in there. And if you have any specific thoughts for things you'd like to be involved in with HPN, projects you'd like to do or projects you'd like to see happen, but especially if you're willing to help with them, that would be really good. Um, please uh, fill out the form for that now or later. And Thank of course, you. if you want to continue this conversation, I personally will go over to the gather space afterwards and that's always available too. Okay. Sounds good. Great. Well, I just, I just want to thank everybody um, uh, for coming and, and sharing your perspectives from all over the world. Super exciting. And um, so thanks you all. Yeah. And I hope to see you in the gather space later, but um, yeah, Risa, Chris, it's a pleasure doing this with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone.